would a Muslim government that had Hamas or, or, or ISIS or Egyptian Brotherhood mentality, could they accept having half of it? No, they could not. So it, it's a non-starter. It would be, it would be an, it's a non-starter because not only would it be difficult from a, um, you know, a political point of view, meaning selling that to the Palestinian people, especially supporters of Hamas, um, there is a spiritual point of view. You know, if you're a Hamasnik, right? Right. God a, a new one. expressly forbids you from ceding one inch of this sacred land to the Yahud, to the Jews, and to the Christians. So how, there. Can we, how can we talk about it? The only way we can talk about a two-state solution is to do it with the group that doesn't have the same ideology as Hamas or the Brotherhood. Shalom, friends. I'm Mitch Glazer, president of Chosen People Ministries. And today we have Robert Nicholson with us. He's the founder and president of the Philos Project, and he's here to share some key findings in a recent survey they conducted to gauge American Christian viewpoints on the ongoing Israel-Hamas conflict. The Philos Project partnered with Lifeway Research of the Southern Baptists to conduct this comprehensive survey. And with rising concerns about global anti-Semitism, this initiative will help us to assess American Christian sentiments concerning the conflict and a number of other swirling issues raised by the recent attacks of October 7th and the ensuing war between Israel and Hamas. Before we begin our discussion, let me introduce my friend, Robert Nicholson. Robert is the president and the executive director of the Philos Project which he founded in 2014. Robert is also the co-founder and a board member of Passages Israel, a program committed to bringing young adults to Israel, particularly young Christian adults. I admire the great work Robert has been doing uh, since 2014 and before. Robert was a soldier, a lawyer, a student of the Hebrew language, and it's evident that all these experiences and the skills he has developed over the years has equipped him to lead a global ministry focused on helping us better understand the ever-changing dynamics of the Middle East. And we need to get right to it, so I'm going to ask my first question. So, Robert, thank you for joining us today. Are you ready for my first question? I'm it's ready. A, it's a tough one. Okay. Okay. I don't mean to stump you from the very beginning. You I'm know? ready. I'm ready. Okay. So can you tell us more about the Philos Project? That that actually is a hard question sometimes. Uh, uh, the Philos take your, Project- Take your time. Uh, as you said, founded in 2014. I think I met you, Mitch, shortly before that. The Philos Project is dedicated to promoting positive Christian engagement in the Near East for us Christian engagement with the Near East starts, first of all, with uh, engagement with Israel, right? Mm -hmm. The main connection point for any Christian uh, for thinking about this region. So a lot of our work, our programming, is education-related, you know, helping Christians of different backgrounds, we're non-denominational in that sense, uh, better understand their spiritual connection to Israel and the country as it is today. So we do that through a number of trips and leadership programs. We started, as you mentioned, passages, bringing Christian college students to Israel. Uh, but we also, I think unique for a Christian organization focused on Israel, are interested in the rest of the region, Israel's neighbors. Uh, one of the things I've spent quite a bit of time on over the years myself uh, are is, is you know working with the Christian communities, these indigenous Christian communities inside Israel but also in places like Egypt and, and Lebanon, uh, Iraq, um, Syria, Jordan. And uh, we can get into that maybe if you like, but uh, for us, these things are not unrelated, right? Insofar as we're connected to the Jewish people spiritually and, and morally, historically, we feel the same way about Christian communities of the region. So we do education there as well. We also do some advocacy. And really, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is build up a, a new generation, kind of next generation of Christian leaders, uh, key emphasis on Hispanic Christians, black Christians. We do a lot of work with Catholics, believe it or not, usually never part of this conversation. Uh, and of course, many, many uh, evangelicals. So it's been it's been a wild ride, 10 years. We've, uh, you know, I think as an organization, we might be uh, 
described as as innovative. Really, what that means is fifty percent of the things that we try don't work. Um, but we're always interested in trying new things, experimenting with new programs. Um, and thank God we've had a lot of success, a lot of great donors. And you know, now we've been around long enough that people who've graduated from our programs, gone on our trips, have actually taken positions in, in important places inside the church, inside government. And I think for me, the coolest thing about my job is to watch that journey. You know, kid comes in shortly after college, gets really excited about this work, it clicks, they understand why Israel and America have something in common, why they as a Christian have a spiritual homeland in Jerusalem, and then they go do something about it, go yeah. work at the State Department or, you know. So that's that for me is the most exciting part of my job. Oh, you've hired some very sharp young people, I'll tell you that. We have great people. You, re you really do. So how many uh, kids do you think you've taken to Israel over the years? So through Passages, uh, which is the larger initiative that sure. I'm running, uh, we've taken 11,000, 11,000 Christian college students, which is crazy actually, um, from all over the country. I mean, it's unbelievable, yeah. really. And uh, it, what's cool is that some of them are so into it and they show such promise in terms of leadership that they come back and serve as a, um, we call them a, a, a coach. A, a co they're basically a coach, yeah, on, on buses of other kids. And so you see this movement start to build. That's, that's through passages. Philos is a little bit more selective. We've probably brought, we do a lot of like um, current leaders, people such as yourself. Let's say that you were a big, important guy who ran an organization. And we thought, you know what? Mitch Glazer, this isn't true, of course. Mitch Glazer, he really needs to understand this country and uh, because of the work that he does. And so I, we would- I'm ready to you take you on a trip. <laughs> you yeah. should take me. <laughs> but yes, we would take you. We'd, so we've done uh, probably about a thousand people that, you know, like promising young leaders as well as established writers, journalists, policymakers, big pastors and things like that. Yeah, it's wonderful. I mean, I want you, I, I should thank you because you've helped our work immeasurably. Yeah? Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're partners, you know. You, you bring them, you inspire them, you train them. And then we go speak at their churches. And yeah, we work with them. Take some of them on our staff. That's great. Encourage you to take some of them on your staff. Thank keep, you, Mitch. Keep up the good work. Thank you. And I recommend any of you, um, you should go to the Philos website. It's a great website, and take a look to see how you can pray for them and support them. And I think that uh, all that you do to help uh, Philos would would really be wonderful. Uh, so we both like surveys. Yes, we do. And uh, one of the reasons we like surveys is not just because number crunching sometimes is a pleasant break from the other work that we do. However, um, probably the reason we like surveys the best is because they, they teach us. And uh, this one uh, that you've done recently with Lifeway, boy, you know, I've, I've enjoyed it. I've sent it out to all sorts mm. of people. And and I think it's 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 a very important snapshot in a particular period, mm -hmm. uh, uh, post October seventh, that really is going to be a, a benchmark. And others are going to do future surveys. Mm. Certainly, I will, and but and you will too, probably. But it really, it, it's a snapshot. Things will. You got it at a very good moment mm -hmm. in November, correct? Yeah, November. And so that's very, very important. So can you tell us, um, because I, did you do a major survey like this before? I didn't see it if you did. We've done we've done surveys with Lifeway. We did another survey, it was a private survey. Well, the, the surveys we did with Lifeway were, I think 2017, 2018, they were on Hispanic Christians and black Christians respectively. Right. And um, the other one we did was more general. This is the most, Recent one, we hadn't done one for a number of years. And this one's over 1,200 people. Over 1,200, 1,252, I want to say. And um, so I have some, um, I have some questions about about the survey, maybe. Sure. Um, so one one of the numbers that was interesting to me is that 75% of those surveyed surveyed believed Hamas to be an extremist and isolated group. In other words, isolated from other Muslims not just uh, Jewish people or Christians. So would you, I, I, I would suppose you agree with that. As, 
as somebody once told me when I was looking at my survey, I said, well, I don't believe that. And they said, well, you paid for it. You should believe it, you know? And I said, why would you pay for a survey and not believe what comes right, out, you know? Right. So I, I suppose you believe that 75% probably did say that. I do. Yeah. And I think, you know, I've seen, a, I've seen several polls since. There was a Harvard-Harris poll that came out that was a just good one. Uh, maybe a few weeks ago. Yeah that uh, I think confirmed that the vast majority of Americans understand Hamas to be, you know, what you and I would describe as evil and uh, probably not reflective of where a lot of other, um, you know, even Muslims, even, are. Even Muslims are at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, they, they are an extremist group. Um, so neither of us are probably total experts on Islam and, and particularly extremist Islam, but I think you know a lot. And uh, our folks listening and watching, uh, you know, they, they, they're watching because they want to learn. Mm -hmm. they, want, they want to be educated. So uh, tell us just a little bit about Hamas. And uh, my, my fundamental question at the end of it all is, what kind of worldview mm would people have that caused them to do the horrific things against other people, not just Jewish people, but against other people, against their bodies? I mean, what drives them? Mm -hmm. could, you, could you maybe give us a little help with that? Sure. I think maybe the most important thing to say about Hamas is that unlike other Muslim groups, Hamas has a very overt and very aggressive um, political ideology. Mm. Now, Islam as a religion, and this I'm not making up anything new here, is understood by many scholars, Muslim scholars, as being distinctive from, say, Christianity in that even in what you might call normal Islam, there is a political dimension that you don't find uh, right. in, in many other religions, right? It, this, it, if you read the New Testament, it's very clear that Jesus was not trying to build a state. Right. If you read the Quran, you realize that this actually was intended to be, to some extent, the charter for a state, right? right? That has an army. Well, that's, I mean, that in itself is very helpful. It's a very important fact that many people don't know. They, I think a lot of people, maybe not your listeners, but many people from a place of, you know, good intentions think that religions are basically fungible, you know? that we're all kind of, we're we have the basic conception of God, more or less the same. We all, we just wanna love people and be nice. And that's not in fact uh, the case for most religions. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. And Islam I think is very distinctive in that way, but Hamas takes that to the next level. Hamas historically is an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood. What is the Muslim Brotherhood? Yeah. The Muslim Brotherhood was created, believe it or not, there's an, an analogy in, in maybe the evangelical movement in that it's a kind of revivalist movement in response to the decadence of modernity, you might say. Mm. This organization came about that was basically saying, God is the answer, right? Not all of these you know, liberal enlightenment and going to college and we gotta get back to the basics. We gotta get back to the Bible, you could say, right? Except the Quran. And they began to build, um, starting in Egypt, but then across the Islamic world, um, think of it as Sunday schools and community centers and health clinics and little, you know, Quran study groups and men's groups and all right. these different things, right? Uh, I think put aside what you think about it, case study in grassroots revival movement. Hmm. And um, the the ultimate goal of this movement was basically to bring back what many Muslims then and now feel is missing from the world, which is a caliphate. Right, normative Islam, like the 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 end state, is that uh, Islam, when properly observed, is observed within a, a political context, and we're, we're we're just a few weeks out, Mitch, from the 100 year anniversary of the fall of the last caliphate in 1924, the Ottoman Caliphate. Uh huh. Um, it's early March, I think March 4th. And uh, many people from that day until now want to bring it back. And the Muslim Brotherhood more or less wants to bring it back. Hamas is the, let's call it the Palestinian chapter of the Muslim Brotherhood. And they have a very distinctive addition to what they believe. They believe that Jerusalem being the third holiest site in Islam, and let's call it greater Palestine, Palestine, is sacred land. It's holy land. 
and is unfortunately being ruled by these unbelievers, these infidels, these Jews and their Christian allies who need to be not only conquered but thrown off the land so that a proper, sacred Islamic state can be established in its place. And not just because we want to liberate the Palestinians. That's like part of it. Right. It's because Allah wants us to do it. What, what, what made the land sacred? What made the land sacred? Um, well, there is, there is a recognition in Islam of, of previous prophets, people you and I would recognize, Jewish prophets. Now, of course, in the Islamic worldview, these are all Muslims. Abraham was a Muslim. They kind of read it back into history. Um, and uh, although Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, except sort of in passing, n not by name, um, there is an understanding traditionally that Muhammad uh, went to Jerusalem and from there ascended into heaven, had this sort of divine experience, came back down, you know, appropriately enlightened, and um, you know, from there was able to, you know, complete his mission as as commanded by God. Jerusalem's the third holiest site. It's a sacred city. The Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount is uh, a very important site in Islam. And um, strangely, there has never been, th despite everything I just said, no Muslim empire or state has ever made Jerusalem a capital, even though it's been under Islamic rule more or less since the year 636. Right. So there's, on one hand, what seems to be uh, a major emphasis, like Jerusalem is really important. On the other hand, historically, you see that actually it's been more or less a backwater for you know 1,400 years. So let's say Hamas or you know ISIS or whatever, they seem very similar in their ideology. Let's say they politically take over Jerusalem. Let's say that you have a two-state solution, for example. It's a very realistic choice here. So let's say you have a two-state solution. Uh, because of the ideology that you've been talking about, would a Muslim government that had Hamas or, or, or ISIS or Egyptian Brotherhood mentality, could they accept having half of it? No, they could not. So it, it's a non-starter. It, it would be, an, it's a non-starter because not only would it be difficult from a, um, you know, a political point of view, meaning selling that to the Palestinian people, especially supporters of Hamas, um, there is a spiritual point of view. You know, if you're a Hamasnik, right? Right. God, it's a, it's a new one. Expressly forbids you from ceding one inch of this sacred land to the Yahud, to the Jews, and to the Christians. So how, can we, how can we talk about a? The only way we can talk about a two-state solution is to do it with a group that doesn't have the same ideology as Hamas or the Brotherhood or. The dilemma, the dilemma is this. The Jewish people of Israel do not, as far as I've ever seen, want to rule over Palestinians. They prefer separation of some kind. Um, there's also a tension because the West Bank, right, or Judea and Samaria is in fact the heartland of the Jewish people. Um, on the other hand, the idea of seeding for the sake of peace, right? Pikuach nefesh, right? For, to, to preserve life. We're going to, okay, fine. This is our sacred land, but we're going we're gonna to just seed claims to it for now for the sake of, of preserving everyone's life. The problem is, as desirable as that is, um, everything you say makes it impossible for now, right? There would have to be a much more moderate um, Palestinian camp. And in theory, there is one, but it, for whatever reason, feels unable to call out the radicalism, the extremism, the violence of its Hamas counterpart. Until yeah. that emerges, it's very hard to imagine a two-state solution. And which camp is that, and where is it? So the other camp, the big other party, there are a number of Palestinian parties. It gets very dense very quickly. Uh, Fatah party is what it's called. This is Yasser Arafat's party. Okay. Um, runs the PLO, runs the Palestinian Authority, kind of the statelet that controls uh, the Palestinians of the West Bank. Palestinian territories, West Bank, Gaza, West Bank, been controlled by this secular moderate camp. Um, Gaza has been controlled by Hamas. 
the critique of the secular moderate camp is it's not as secular or moderate as we would like it to be. And we're not exactly sure that Hamas is not going to take it over. Take this over the, the Palestinian Authority. Take over the Palestinian Authority. Because when you look at, we, you love surveys, as I do, when you look at the polling numbers, you find that many, many Palestinians in the West Bank are not only okay with Hamas, they're actually extremely enthusiastic, especially after October 7th, which is, of course, horrific. Hor horrific. So uh, you also have uh, Hezbollah, and so, and you also have Iran lurking, right? And so the connection between um, Iran, Hezbollah, uh, the Egyptian Brotherhood, ISIS, and Hamas is a more caliphate-oriented type of militant extremist, even eschatological yes. Islam. So tell us about that. What is it? How do the end times slip in there mm. from a, a Muslim point of view, and how does that impact things? These are conversations that are not being had at the State Department. Unfortunately, these things are not entertained seriously. No, of course But not. they make a really big difference, and you're right. There are many differences between the groups you just mentioned, the biggest one being that some of these groups are, are Sunni Muslims and some are right. Shi'i. Hezbollah is a Shi'ite organization, and that's why they work so closely with Iran. Whatever, a lot of intricacies, not important for this conversation. What matters is, is the punchline that you said, which is that all of these have some kind of caliphate oriented, that is political version of Islam oriented view of the world that is very much bound up with the end is nigh, right? And the, the Islamic end times are different from Christian end times, but not entirely different. There's some familiar stuff in there, right? Jesus comes back. There's an extra guy, you know, Mahdi. Um, the Mahdi, right? Um, but a similar kind of apocalyptic scenario yeah. that for the Muslim point of view, traditionally involves uh, pretty much the, the wholesale annihilation of, of the Jews to the point where there's a famous hadith, a, a famous saying in the Islamic tradition that at that time, every tree and every rock will shout, oh, Muslim, Look over here, there's a Jew hiding behind me, right. right? So this is you know, maybe not very important from the perspective of the White House or the State Department, but these intangible, these invisible things are actually driving real behavior. Yeah. And we're in the minds of the people who broke through that fence and went and, and butchered murdered. all these people. Yeah. The problem is, of course, is that uh, those who are not real Christians, or even some Hasidic or ultra-Orthodox Jewish people take these things pretty seriously, is that when you ignore the spiritual realities uh, that drive us and that drive a lot of people, they drive you and me, yeah. they drive my Hasidic friends, and they drive ISIS, and they drive um, Hezbollah, and of course they drive Hamas and uh, it shapes their values. Mm -hmm. um, these are not people who are looking to get away from conflict or they're lo actually looking to cause conflict mm -hmm. so that they can then make peace. And um, so we have a very difficult situation then uh, because we have people who are driven by their ideology and by their theology rather than something else. And there's when you when they come face to face with people with lesser spiritual commitments, mm. these guys, a lot of them, are, I mean, look at the great Christian martyrs. Mm. They were willing to die for their faith. You know, these guys, whatever they believe about 70 virgins and everything else, they're willing to die for their faith because they believe in the reality of an afterlife. And they believe that they're part of God's Allah's plan in bringing down the things of this world, which definitely include the Jews. Mm -hmm. And so f fighting against that kind of thing uh, is, is just not easy. So as particularly as evangelicals and born again believers who love the Lord and love the Bible, um, we have a better way of approaching some of these things because we believe all this stuff. That's right. And other people don't, and they sell it short. And you're right, the State Department's not talking like this. Sometimes people will say to me, they hear about the Philos Project, they think, 
you're going over there and wearing Christianity on your sleeve. You're picking a side. Like you're never going to make any headway whatsoever by, you know, being overt about what you believe. On the contrary, you should hold back and create a safe space so people of different faith. I said, listen, my experience, and I've been on the ground in many countries, right? And I've talked to many different people, um, including, let's just say, some very senior people in Hamas. And one of the paradoxes is that me doing this work, or you as a Christian, is actually something that these people, whoever they are, this is a very religious region, Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, there's something about us coming in and wearing that's actually very sensible, recognizable, and even appreciated, right? They know who you are. They know you stand for something. Right. They, they may totally disagree with it. Their eschatology may see you as the arch villain in the story, but they understand that you are different from you know, some secular guy in a suit coming in from Washington, D.C. Would you say that Hamas would look at secular Israelis as weak? Or vulnerable, at least. I think, yes. I think secular people in general are, like true secular people, are hard for anyone in that part of the world to, to understand. Certainly people who are very deep in their faith, like right. someone in Hamas. Yeah. It looks very vapid, empty, and you're right, vulnerable. Yeah. So that was very helpful. And I'm sure a lot of those who are watching and listening uh, found that extremely helpful. But let's move back into the survey just a little bit. So if I ask you, you know, I, and sometimes people hate these questions, Robert, so forgive me, but please answer it. So, so if I could ask you, what are, what are maybe the three most significant discoveries from the survey? Now, not that you find interesting, but what are the three most significant parts of the survey, the results, that actually might impact your strategy and your hmm. goals and your determination of projects in the future. Hmm. How will it shape you? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'll run through a few of the things that jump out at me immediately, and maybe we can discuss some of them and sure. you know, maybe get in a little bit closer. Um, I think the the top line item, which I did not take for granted going into this, is that notwithstanding everything we're seeing on the news still the vast majority of American Christians um, are on the right side of this, right? 83% say Israel must take bold measures to respond to Hamas. You cited the 75% number about Hamas being um, you know, bad and, and even isolated. And you see that on those kinds of like big moral questions, people are still good, <laughs> which right, right. was I, I, in that thank moment, God. right, thank God. I, yeah. I, I, I don't take anything for granted anymore. Um, very pleased to see that the support was still strongest among evangelicals. Um, I think- As compared to As compared Catholics to or... Catholics, mainline Protestants, right? Certain- um, Were Catholics ahead of mainline Protestants in their support of Israel? We use the word favorability, and you right. used it too. It's a good yeah. general cap right. capture. Um, that, I'd have to go back and look at that. I'd have to go back and look at that. My sense is that people don't realize Catholics, although they there are some places in the survey where they came out, I don't know, not not good uh, on some of these More issues. Socially liberal, maybe. Socially liberal, um, you could say, yeah. Um, and you also got to factor in that, although Catholics, you know, conservative Catholic, will think about Israel as you know a place of shared values certainly an ally of the united yeah. states moral cause post holocaust they're not bringing some of the other things that many evangelicals bring into the into the story right sure. so they're just a different kind of flavor to their 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 support um another big thing that came out and this is not news to you or me which which was the youth um, really abysmal performance by people south of 30, right? And the lower you go in in that group, the, the worse it gets. Um, so you want to paint that a little brighter or just... So it's not all bad, right? And it's very easy to... Uh, it's pretty bad. To, to, to only look at the, the people who did. So there were a lot of people who came out good on the survey, certainly. But I mean, you're talking about basically one out of two right, who young people who are just so conflicted that they can't make up their mind or they're actually going the other way. 
And I, you know, it sounds trite, cliche, but I do blame social media, these algorithms. You know, we've seen more and more what TikTok is doing, probably with an agenda. But people are so bombarded. I'd, I'd say even people on my staff, right? The, lo- the younger they are, the more likely they are to come to me very conflicted because they saw a video, right? Or, you know, some post of some influencer that made them say, wait a minute, am I on the right side of this? Right. And right. this is a generation that, unlike me, certainly unlike you, grew up in social media. I mean, they can't remember a time when there wasn't social media. God forbid. So the young, the young, like if you're asking, how does it help me think about shaping programming? What I realize is not only is it bad, it's actually worse than I thought. And that whole space, the information space in general is, 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 is a battleground just as important in some ways as the actual battleground in Gaza. So as, as I was looking at it, I, I mean, this is exactly what our surveys have been showing. We've been doing them over, you know, like 12 years. And uh, we've seen that number. You know, we keep the 18 to 29 year category the same. So people move out of that. Category. Right, right. Some of us well out of it. And, but we keep, but that group, it's, it's, it's not the same people, but it's the same category. Mm. So the people might be impacting the next level, the 30 to 40 years year old. So we might see that one get worse and then the next one get worse. But the 18 to 29 year old stays constant. So for example, in your survey, I noticed that there was a difference. You ready? 18 to 29. Mm -hmm. Their favorable perception of Israel was 30% less than those 65 and over. That's correct. Yeah. 30% less. I mean, I found that. I mean, I I know these things, but when I saw it in black and white, I said, wow. And and honestly, it makes me say, Philos is doing something really great. Because what what you're doing is you're you're shooting at you know at the younger group. I don't mean you're shooting the younger group, but you're sometimes you're, I want you're to. aiming. You're aiming, you're not shooting. You're I, but <laughs> let me just underscore your point. Yeah. This question is not a question of you know, in the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, which side do you, this is just overall perception of Israel. Yes. On its own. Yes. Like, do you think it's mostly good or mostly not good? Right. And less than 50% say they have a positive perception. That it is, it's, it's quite shocking. Yeah. Quite shocking. I will say, you know, to the, to the positive end, the thing that I love to see come out in these surveys, and I, I'm, I'm a religious observer of these surveys, is that just like all the others, this survey showed that there is a direct, I repeat, direct correlation between frequency of church attendance yes. and um, favorability toward Israel and answering the right things as, from my perspective on all these questions, right? I do not believe one's uh, you know salvation comes by, you know, punching in at church every Sunday. But I can tell you from looking at these surveys now for years, when you look at a weekly church attendance, uh, church church goer versus a sometimes I go, there's a dramatic difference. And that's, that's Protestant, that's Catholic, that's across the board. So if I was to just sort of land on this planet from Mars and you gave me this and you said, your mission is to, um, you know, build up, Christians who who feel this affinity and want to support their Jewish friends in Israel make a strategy. I would look at these numbers over a period of years and say, we need to get people to go to church. Like I actually think it's that. Of course, Bible reading and, and yeah, reverence of the Bible say, is the other one. I was one. just going to say. Those two metrics are always correlated to the outcomes that we'd like to see, always. And again, friends, if you're going to look at the, uh, at the website and look at the study, make sure you, you push on through all the really neat graphics and get to the end where we start, where uh, Lifeway and Robert start dealing with uh, comparisons uh, because you can see the difference, but you can tie together spirituality, you can tie together, you can also tie together region, you can do gender, you can do age, you can do a lot, but you're right. That constant, constant reminder that regularity with the Lord, whether it be church or Bible reading or prayer, that is so important. And, uh, but
but there's the flip side of it too. So What's I, that? I was speaking to a uh, Korean pastor uh, who loves Israel and so on, and uh, and I said, "Have you were you raised this way?" He says, "Oh, I was raised the opposite." Hmm. I said, "Wow!" So what happened? He said, "One day I was reading my Bible and God spoke to me, and He said." When I say Israel, I mean Israel. Mm. <laughs> and he said, I realize I've been teaching my people wrong. Wow. And so I got up at, in the pulpit the next Sunday and I repented of my sin. <laughs> and I told them that we need to take the Bible literally. We just need to take it for what it says. Yeah. And I'm offering my resignation. And if it's a 500 member church. And, I, and therefore, if you don't want me to stay, I won't stay. They met during the week. Next Sunday, um, the elder comes up and speaks uh, on behalf of the congregation and says, we've all decided to accept your point of view. <laughs> so keep your job. And But I asked him, what, what was the real key to this whole process? He mm -hmm. says, it's just reading the Bible. Yeah. You know? It's and, actually that simple. And it's, it's that simple. So if we can get people to read the Bible, so maybe philos and chosen people need to do more Bible reading programs, you know? Or Listen, I, I always say, I work with a lot of people from a lot of denominations and people get hung up on a lot of intermediary objects in terms of liturgy and certain doctrine and practice. And look, it's all important in different ways. But, you know, if there's a hill I'm going to die on apart from Jesus is the Christ, you know, the King of Israel and the world, uh, the Bible is pretty much the main one. That's how I came to faith. That's how I formed all of my views. I mean, every day I'm I'm being shaped again by Scripture, and I think that you know one of the things that worries me, and I actually think is not unrelated to some of the the trends that we're seeing, is that within the evangelical world, right, which has always been kind of the the burning hot core of uh, of Christian support, support, Zionism, yeah. right? Uh, there is there has been. I'm speaking very generally, but a a, a how can I say, a, a decreasing emphasis on the text and an increasing em emphasis on kind of all the other services available at a church, right? The worship and the different programs and all of them important in their own way. And preachers but, not always preaching from the text. And, uh, that's what I'm saying. Stories. Yeah. No, stories, right? Anecdotes. You take a verse and riff for 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm probably a little too traditional. I've got a you know, I think I'd turn back the clock a bit if I could, but if there's any one thing that we can do, um, getting people just, I mean, you can't get people to read anything these days, but my goodness, just getting Christians to read scripture often, deeply, um, you would accomplish all the things, forget Israel, right? All the things that, that we want to see. Yeah, I, I'm I, not passionate about this at all. Yeah, I can tell. <laughs> so was there another trend or theme that you found that might be ministry shaping? So Maybe even come up with a new project because you've seen it. Well, that, that's still, still stewing on that. There are a few things, but too early. I think one of the things that it's just more of a general insight, um, and it comes out a couple places in the survey, uh, and it actually gets very practical here. There is a real gap between I'd say kind of the Christian impulse or, or aspirations for peace and the reality on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, there's, there's a question here about kind of, you know, what do you, where should things go in terms of Israelis and Palestinians? And what you see is like good Christian people, you know, they want peace, they want stability, they want, they don't want innocent lives, Israeli or Palestinians to die. But you see suddenly where, where there's, on the big moral questions, a lot of unanimity, it breaks down quickly, and people are kind of, they're checking the box of the question that sounds the nicest. What I worry about is as this war and its aftermath drag on, right. and all of the dilemmas that we just were talking about come to the fore, the practical stuff, okay, Gaza, who governs it? And like, it, it can't just be nice on paper, it's gotta be nice in reality, that Christians, most of whom are so immersed in social media will start to you know lose heart because it's looking hard it's getting ugly and my goodness this has been going on now for six months nine months 
So it's not a an insight that leads to a program, but it's awareness that things may get darker before the light. Like I'm a little worried about the fact that this is not going to end up in some kind of picture perfect two state solution. Everybody's happy, like right. not in the near term, and that, and that that worries me. So that that brings me to actually one of my key questions, and and uh, how does the conflict end? So so in this in the survey 56% of those surveys said that it will conclude with negotiations for peace and 53% say it will end with Israel subduing Hamas so 56 so it seems like some people right now cuz remember you're at a point in t- you were in November yeah you know when we are still having f- fierce battles in February and the hostages are not released we found out that what 32 plus 20, 52 yeah, like hostages 50 are, are died in captivity. Mm-hmm. You know, people are mad. Yeah. They're just very angry and, and hurt. And uh, so, you know, Christians are, are seeing this through social media and, you know, which is probably the main channel and uh, along with all the, all the others. But so 56% say it will conclude with negotiations for peace. That's in November. I don't know what the number would be today. It'd be interesting. You know? And 53% say it will end with Israel subduing Hamas. So, of course, that's the stated Israeli goal. We must destroy Hamas. And I don't think anybody wants to stop until um, all the leaders of Hamas are are captured or dead. But on the other hand, 83% agree that Israel must take bold measures to defend itself against terrorism. So that, for me, that was an interesting uh, number. Mm. Uh, Just a few more, 52% believe that Israelis Israelis feel the civilians killed are justifiable in pursuit of military goals. So over half, even though we think that, I mean, and of course our hearts are broken to see we know that Palestinian Palestinian in, in, innocents are suffering, and it breaks our heart. Mm-hmm. I mean, just flat out. That's right. We know that, it, but fifty-two percent of American Christians believe that Israelis feel the civilians killed are justifiable in pursuit of military goals. I'm not even sure if that's correct on the Israeli part because mm. I, I, people are heart sick over mm-hmm. it. And 77% of U.S. Christians believe Hamas feels that the civilians who are killed are justifiable Mm -hmm. in their pursuit of military goals. So U.S. Christians view 77% of Hamas as as being uncaring and feeling that the end justifies the mean. That number goes down in the minds of Christians. Not necessarily, we didn't survey Muslims or Hamas or right. Palestinians or, or, or Israelis. 52% believe that Israeli, Israelis feel the civilians killed. I felt pretty good about that number mm-hmm. in a lot of ways yeah. because I think that there's a huge difference in, if I can just say it, a Judeo Christian worldview and the worldview of this eccentric, violent, sort of catastrophic type of mentality where human life is disregarded. You know, in the Bible, God created man and woman. He said, tov ma'od, very good. So the Bible is, and and the story of, of the Bible is, makes uh, the things of this world sacred. And when, if I can compare it for a moment to, to the Holocaust, because I can't help it. Mm-hmm. If I compare it to the Holocaust, the first thing that the Nazis had to do, and it took time and skill to do it, unfortunately, is they totally dehumanized the Jewish people. Mm -hmm. Totally dehumanized. They just, they're animals. You know, if if they get in your way, just rip their bodies apart, kill them. And Hamas, I think, had, was driven by the same worldview. Israeli soldiers, have a lot of restrictions about what they can do and what they can't do. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they fail. No army is perfect. But it's good to see, I think, that Christians have at least recognized the impact 
of the different worldviews between, let's just say, most are not believers, between secular Israeli soldiers and Islam, Islamic soldiers. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a different v- worldview and view of mankind that the, the human body people are are made are made in God's image. They're they're sacred. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And and so um, it was actually startling to me that Christians picked up on that. Mm. I, I, I know I feel bad thinking that way, but I, I just didn't know whether or not it would be noticed. Mm-hmm. And it's a high number. It's a very high number. And I want Christians, in the midst of all this horror, I want Christians to think well of Jewish people. Yes. Because, and this is my, I mean, you can comment on this all you want, but I, I the last one is, where do you see uh, the level of anti-Semitism going? Mm. Because it does seem that those who maybe are not Christians act almost in hatred against Israel and Jewish people. It's almost like they forgot October 7th, yeah. why, why Isra- Israelis were responding this way. Um, but how do you see uh, this working out? Do you see anti-Semitism increasing um and what about christians where mm. are they when it comes to how they feel about the jewish people oh big questions anti-semitism now i'm just talking statistically is not only you know it was on the rise before 10 7 it's it's on the rise even more um it's all over the world it's in this country for sure uh, we've seen it here in this city, Mitch, right in New York City, and I've seen it with my own eyes. You know, I've been to some of these um, these uh, rallies and and seen the counter rallies, the protest. I mean, just hatred, pure hatred. And I would say that many of these people have adopted that view of Jews as subhuman, right, from the traditional Islamic point of view, the the sons of apes and pigs, right. At least that part of the Islamic worldview adopted by Hamas and and other organizations like them. I think that. There is, you know, it's it's hard not to think about it spiritually. Um, I'm always thinking at, at, at two levels at the same time. Maybe like you, right? There's sort of like, okay, there's we're in this world. Let's not get carried away. Let's be practical and pragmatic. And but then, you know, you have to be. You're always looking at that other level, the spiritual dimension. And it's not new, uh, not even surprising to see the the world in, in a very irrational way and on mass gang up against the Jews at their moment of peak victimhood, at least since the Holocaust. Isn't that something? It's, you cannot explain it any other way. Like, I would understand total indifference and apathy. Be like, okay, fine, people are dying. There's people dying right now, by the way, in far higher numbers in Sudan. Nobody's even interested in the slightest. Um, So why is everybody so interested and why do they all line up so spontaneously on the other side of the issue? It's hard not to see it. Uh, from a spiritual dimension as being a hatred, not only against Jews because whatever, they don't like the way they look or what, but uh, a hatred that is part of this, you know, it's really flipping the biblical narrative on its head, right? What do we as believers of the Bible believe about the Jewish people? We believe they are a chosen people covenanted by God with a covenant that has not been broken, right? It's mysterious. It's hard to understand the relationship with the church, but we understand there's something there. Right from this point of view, this other worldview, uh, which is you know flipped completely, the Jews are not only not chosen; they're like expressly unchosen. Right? They are truly the the villain of the of the global story, the human story. So much so that the feeling on the street, and sometimes you meet these people in real life, is that if we can just take care of this Jewish problem, if we could just get rid of this thing called Israel everything will get back to normal everything will be fine and you see unfortunately echoes of this even in the american presidential administration right where as although all of these terrible things have happened there is suddenly this this impulse to give concessions to palestinians to notwithstanding everything we just said declare a palestinian state or force israelis to do x y or z so i think the anti-semitism is rising not only at the level of the street which is, that's a real thing that just personally concerns me. But I think at a at the much higher level of, I call it international relations, 
there is there is an uptick that I, I haven't seen in my lifetime. Now I'm comforted by one fact, and I'll stop here. That you know, I always I believe in this like double movement of history, right? On one hand, everything's getting worse. On, on the one hand, the church is growing and everything's kind of getting better, or at least going to a place where, you know, history will be consummated, et cetera. Um, and so even as I see the darkness rising, um, I'm very comforted by the fact that the global church is growing, right? Um, there are, there's evangelical Christians right now praying play all across Africa and Latin America and all through Asia, right? Many of these people instinctively, without ever having met a Jewish person, feel that connection they with do. them. They do, they do. And they- Much more than in the West, that's for Much sure. more than in the West. Yeah. I think in the next 50 years, you're, you're going to see kind of the Christian Friends of Israel map inverted completely. And all of that support will be coming from the global South. Yep. Right. And what, where that will go, how that will affect practical things like UN votes, or we don't even know. But as, as dark as it may seem, there, you know, God is always working. Right. And even in places like Iran, you know, the underground church in Iran, there are people in Iran who are looking at all of these events and coming down on the right side of these issues. So you ask where are Christians at? Uh, in America, I'm, I'm deeply concerned for the reasons we mentioned the youth, but even the leadership. Um, and I have I won't share them on the air, but personal anecdotes of people I've talked to asking them, hey, would you you should be out there saying something? And they're like, no, no, I, I don't think I will. Um, there are a lot of good people. And we see in this survey tons of good people. Most of the people are good people on this issue. Um, but we have a lot of work to do. You know, we can be we can take comfort in, in what's happening around the world, take comfort that people are still holding the line. But. You know, I do think God is sovereign, of course, but it's incumbent, I think, upon us as Christians to do what we can in our small circle. Most people are not working on this like you and I, sure. but we have families and we have a neighbor on that side and a neighbor on that side. And these things come up in conversation. And I think even for people listening who are, you know, just regular guy, regular girl, um, this concerns you, right? This is part of, you're part of this story. And I think, in the aggregate, all of us talking, having conversations. When you hear those slightly anti-Semitic things, like, oh, those Jews are doing it again, stupid Israel, like you have some kind of duty to say, ah, wait a minute, I, there's there's more to the story. So I, I have a lot of faith in those people. They're out there, I know them. So uh, I'm not drowning in the dark, but we, we need to take it seriously. It's a, it's a tough moment. So tell a friend. Tell a friend. <laughs> <laughs> to stand up uh, for the Jewish people. Um, just real quickly, and then we're just going to conclude. And and that is, what is the link? I mean, I mean, the Jewish people were at the center of the story, not because they chose to be. They weren't even. They were created. They were not just chosen. You know, Abraham and Sarah were little old to have kids. Mm -hmm. You know, but God performed a miracle. He performed another miracle with another Jewish person some years later. And the people and the person, the Jewish people and the Jewish Messiah, have been inextricably linked, joined yes. at the hip, yes. hip from the very beginning. And as Jesus was born in a Jewish context and died as a Jewish man in Jerusalem, so one day the Jewish people will call unto the one who was pierced. They will ask, uh, they will ask God for forgiveness, they will repent of their sins, they'll mourn for their sins, and uh, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives will be crushed in two. And the day will come when the Jewish Messiah will reign as king. Now, who wouldn't want that to happen? It's, uh, you know, I think a lot of Christians don't realize that that's that is all part of our tradition, right? We believe that we believe that it's Jesus our, Christ will come back and land in Jerusalem. It, it's our story. It's our story. Our story. And the devil is going to do everything he can to destroy the conclusion of the story as he tried to destroy the first part of the story. Mm -hmm. But he's not going to do it. He's going to fail. And who better to use? I mean, think about it. What's the, as a Jewish person, what was the number one reason why I wouldn't consider Jesus? The number one reason was because I was raised to believe that Jews couldn't become believers in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why? Because of all the rotten things that quote unquote Christians have done to the Jews. So it is interesting, the devil, who's not stupid, figured it out. 
Mm. That if he could turn God's people again, uh, turn the the church against the Jewish people, that that would be a powerful way to keep the Jews from believing in Jesus. Mm. It's true. It works. And so my prayer for you and my prayer for for all of us is that we would uh, recognize that God still loves the Jewish people, the apple of his eye. He doesn't want the Jewish people to be destroyed. He wants the Jewish people to behave well. There's no doubt about it. He's called the Jewish people and all people to obedience. And so uh, we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for peace. We recognize true peace won't come until the Prince of Peace reigns on his rightful throne, but we can make incremental steps, mm-hmm. you know? Amen. And, and so thank you, Robert, for being here. Thank you for articulating some things I believe with my whole heart mm. better, than, better than I do. How could a Gentile do that? I don't, I don't know. know. Lucky day, I guess. You know, I guess. Anyway. Thanks, thanks for having me, Mitch. Thank you for great. your ministry. Thank you. Lord, I thank you for Robert. I thank you for Philo's project. I pray your blessing in every way on their ministry. And I pray, Lord, that they would gain favor uh, with those who uh, are watching this uh, video or listening to it. And I pray, Father, that you continue to use this survey and the wonderful things that it's it's reminded us of and taught us to strengthen uh, the Philo's project, to strengthen Chosen People Ministries and to give us confidence in serving you among your ancient people. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. God bless you.